how the transmission occurs. We know the risk factors for perinatal transmission. So today there is effective intervention to reduce the risk of perinatal transmission to as low as you can say even 1%. This is by using effective antiretroviral therapy that is using a combination antiretroviral therapy part starting it with early in pregnancy and continuing throughout pregnancy and in the intrapartum period. Elective caesarean section, I'm saying as appropriate because women who are on heart and have a viral load less than 1000, whether you give elective caesarean or vaginal delivery, it doesn't affect the transmission and formula feeding. This is a standard of care in most of the developed countries. As far as the role of antiretroviral drugs is concerned, we have come a long way in the last two decades when the trial using Zydovodine showed effective risk in transmission of 66%. Various drugs and doses have been used, single drug has been used, multiple drugs have been used and even the duration of exposure in pregnancy has been increasing over the years as highlighted by the WHO guidelines which have been following for our patient management. From single dose nevirapine in 2006, the WHO moved to single, do uh, single drug zydovodine starting from late in pregnancy, so an antipartum and an intrapartum component. Then with more evidence in 2010, they revised the guidelines to use either a single drug or a triple drug, but starting early in pregnancy from 14 weeks onwards, continuing antipartum, intrapartum, and if she's using triple drug postpartum when the woman is breastfeeding to reduce the risk of transmission. So the duration in pregnancy during which the pregnancy and the fetus is exposed to the drug is increasing. And in latest 2030 guidelines, which have been adopted by NACO, it says that women, uh, HIV positive women who are pregnant, should be started on heart for preventing perinatal transmission, and then they should continue lifelong, which has also been adopted by our government. And a little difference in our NACO guideline is that cesarean section is only for obstetric indications and exclusive breastfeeding, and the newborn prophylaxis is with nevirapine for six weeks. How does these drugs act? They reduce the maternal viral load and they act as pre and post exposure prophylaxis for the fetus and newborn. There is enough evidence and you're confidently to say that the drugs have an important role and the interventions to reduce perinatal transmission. But what is of concern and increasing concern is the effect of all these drugs on pregnancy outcome. And what is still conflicting are the reports in literature about how does HIV infection affect pregnancy outcome. And this, these are the two things that we are going to discuss today. And Dr. Plagoni will talk about the pregnancy outcome in women with HIV infection. She will present our data. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, my respected teachers, my seniors, and my dear friends. I'll be presenting the pregnancy outcome in women with HIV infection. The objectives, we looked into the objectives in terms of uh, obstetric outcome and neonatal outcome. The obstetric outcome being preterm delivery, gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, anemia, and intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. In the neonatal outcome, we looked into the birth weight, intrauterine growth restriction, and car scores of 1 and 5 minutes, uh, NICO admission, and perinatal transmission. Ours was a case control study. Uh, the controls being HIV negative low risk pregnant women. Uh, the statistical method for the categorical variables, uh, variables were compared with chi square and Fisher's exact test. Uh, T independent test was used to compare the mean value between the two groups. Uh, p value of less than 0 0.05 was considered as statistically significant, and all the data analysis was carried out using Sika software version 12.0. Over the span of 13 years, uh, 212 retrospect, uh, retropositive cases delivered at our unit. Uh, women undergoing NTP and abortions were excluded. Now the outcome measures were compared uh, on the basis of obstetric and neonatal outcomes in women who were HIV positive with low risk HIV negative women. Also the effect of antiretroviral drugs on preterm birth and IVGR was seen. Uh, glance at the HIV counseling and the screening protocol. Any antenatal patient presenting to the antenatal OPD uh, in conjunction with a routine antenatal uh, care is encouraged for HIV screening where she is uh, sent for a pre-test counseling to the test counsellor. 
as per the NSDP guidelines, is uh, provided the uh, option of opt out, and if not willing to undergo the test, at subsequent visits she is sensitized regarding the need for undergoing HIV screening. For women who are willing to undergo the tests, uh, they are tested for HIV using the rapid ELISA techniques. If tested negative, routine antenatal care is given. A woman who is tested as positive is hence referred to the ART clinic uh, in conjunction with the routine antenatal care. At the ART clinic, these uh, stress is led on the involvement of the family, especially the partner, uh, hence the importance of partner counseling and testing procedures. They undergo baseline investigations uh, and specific investigations like CD4 counts and ART is started for these women. Along with this, an education about the importance of decrease in high-risk behavior, the importance of practicing safe sexual methods is also uh, given and the need for prevention of failure to child transmission. The sole aim of all these being to improve the quality of life of these women, prevent maternal to child transmission, treat opportunistic infections, and ensuring a lifelong adherence to antiretroviral treatment. Now, these women with HIV infection were managed with a multidisciplinary team that consisted of an HIV physician, obstetrician, pediatrician, and various support groups. Women were counseled about ART, cesarean section, how they could uh, decrease the risk of vertical transmission by avoiding breastfeeding from 25 to less than 2 percent. They were given a personal prognosis based on the CD4 counts, uh, knowledge regarding decrease in high risk behavior. They were explained that no method of prenatal diagnosis was present, so if the pregnancy was less than 20 weeks period of gestation, they could opt for a pregnancy termination. Also, counsel regarding the neonatal prognosis and the death of infected parents in child's infancy. Women on ART were asked to continue drugs. They were explained about the risk of preterm labor. A plasma CD4 counts were reviewed every three to six months and the need for the ART assessed, prophylaxis for opportunistic infections given. In, along with the routine antenatal test, these women underwent uh, three monthly uh, complete blood counts and LFTs. They were screened for infections co-infections at earliest and again at 28 weeks. These included hepatitis B, C, syphilis, management of the uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea and bacterial vaginosis by a syndromic approach, screened for toxoplasmosis and cytomegalovirus. A yearly cervical cytology baseline was advised. Women on ART were also monitored for drug toxicity, screening for uh, antibodies like Downs with serum biochemistry and NTND scan was advised. A normally scan at 18 to 20 weeks, GTT at 24 to 26 weeks. These women in the antenatal clinic were closely monitored for early detection of IUGR. Now coming to the demographic details, uh, 212 women uh, who presented to us and delivered with us had a mean age of between 25 to 26 years. If you look into the educational status, most of them were literate with good educational background. For 207, this was a first marriage. If you look into the income per capita, most of them belong to lower socioeconomic status. 168 of these women were referred from outside after being diagnosed as HIV positive for further management. 44 of these patients were diagnosed from our antenatal clinic. Coming to the partner details, uh, most of the husbands were either skilled or unskilled laborers. There were 170 husbands who were found to be positive for HIV and 32 zero discordant couples, that is, such a husband tested negative. For 10 couples, uh, the husband's status could not be elicited. The primaries and the multis were almost equally divided, and uh, 18 out of 111 mothers had previous pregnancies that were affected with HIV. 12 of these uh, mothers were diagnosed prior to pregnancy and 200 were diagnosed during pregnancy. Most of the diagnosis was made in the first and the second trimesters. Now, uh, the mode of transmission was elicited based on history from the mother as well as uh, the husband and it was found that 135 gave a history of sexual contact. For 30%, the mode of transmission could not be elicited. This represents the CD4 counts at Brooklyn. Uh, as you can see, uh, most of the women had a CD4 count above 200. Only five per less than five percent had a CD4 count below 50. Now, 12 of these women who were diagnosed prior to pregnancy were already on heart. As for the women who were diagnosed during pregnancy, as has been explained earlier, we have seen a shift in the 
treatment of HIV from use of single dose mevodafin that was given intrapartum initially for the prevention of perinatal transmission to a phase where uh, we, uh, along with uh, single dose mevodafin, we tailed it with zidobutin and amidubin in the postpartum period for up to seven days. Then there was a phase where we were uh, giving drug uh, in a combination of zidobutin and amidubin. And uh, as after the 2010 WHO guidelines, we started giving a uh, triple drug regimen at our institution and uh, last one year has seen that uh, we have been advised to uh, give these patients antiretroviral treatment at the earliest possible whenever they are diagnosed with uh, HIV positive. Eight of these mothers did not receive any treatment. Now coming to the core infections, these mothers also, were also screened for core infections and we found that uh, seven of these had genital herpes. Four had uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, nine of these mothers tested positive for hepatitis virus and three tested positive for HCV virus. Among other co-infections included leprosy in one and one was positive for DDRM. 192 of these mothers delivered term and 20 delivered preterm. Most of the mothers were uh, delivered by cesarean section as per the initial protocols that uh, cesarean section reduces the risk of perinatal transmission. 40% of these mothers opted for permanent method of sterilization in the form of bilateral tubal ligation during cesarean section. Now, this represents the comparison of the obstetric outcomes between the HIV positive and the HIV negative women. And we looked into the various variables of pregnancy induced hypertension, IUGR, preterm birth, anemia, GDM, and ICP, and found that there was no statistical difference. Uh, significant, significant difference between the two groups. However, if we look at the numbers alone, the HIV positive mothers, uh, we see that there is an increase in risk of delivering an IUGR baby. Same goes for the preterm deliveries that were more in HIV positive mothers than the HIV negative mothers. Now, comparison of the neonatal outcomes, uh, the mean birth date was found to be stat uh, statistically significant lower in the HIV positive women, being 2.59 kgs and 2.91 kgs in the HIV negative population. Uh, there were no statistical difference in the perinatal malformation, it was just one malformation in the form of a CTEV in one of the HIV babies of HIV positive mothers. There was a stat significant statistical difference in the rates of NICU admissions being 18 out of 212 in HIV positive group and 5 out of 213 in HIV negative group. At the time of discharge, most of the mothers uh, opted for a top peak that is 178 and 34 mothers opted for breast peak. Coming to the reasons for NICU admissions, we see here that 4 were low birth weight babies, 2 had RTS, 4 of the babies had transient tachypnea of newborn, this is probably because of the increased rate of cesarean sections in the HIV positive mothers. Among the other causes of neoadmissions included uh, seizures, uh, hypoglycemia and one of the baby's mothers was positive for DDR as mentioned before. Here we uh, compared the effect of antiretroviral treatment on preterm delivery and IUGR. We divided the cases on the basis of the treatment that they received. The first group was no treatment or a single dose never happened. The second group received heart, while the third group received either zidobutin or zidobutin with lamibutin. We found that uh, there was a significant reduction in the rates of preterm deliveries in patients receiving heart or zidobutin with lamibutin. However, for IUGR, there was no statistically significant difference found in the three groups. Now, uh, till now, the perinatal transmission as diagnosed by early infant diagnosis has been found in seven of these babies. Uh, these are the details of these seven babies. Most, uh, all of them were delivered by cesarean section. One, may, uh, one of the mothers had opted for breast feed, while the rest were top feed. And uh, these are the drugs that they received during EUC. Four of these babies expired, of which one was found to be PCR positive. Out of the total 212, 148 of these babies followed with us at 6 weeks and uh, were tested by DNA PCR, 7 of which turned to be positive. Till now, 99 of these babies have completed their 18 months follow up and there have been no new positive cases. Um, now, I would like to request Professor Sinha to discuss the management of antenatal patients in the Good afternoon 
to everyone. I am Dr. Sunan. Uh, I just want to tell briefly about the anti trial clinic. We, uh, we have started anti trial clinic in uh, year 2005 and uh, uh, we have enrolled around 9,000 patients till date. And we have active follow up of around 7,000 patients. And we started anti trial therapy in uh, 2,500 patients. And uh, we have ever uh, enrolled 51. Uh, HIV positive pregnant female and currently we have 11 uh, pregnant female who, who are in active follow-up. So I just want to tell you like uh, we have antitrial clinic in uh, medicine OPD and it is funded by uh, uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, National AIDS Control Organization. And what we do, we have uh, VCPC clinic and we have free ART clinic. Whatever patient coming from other department or whatever patient has been referred to us, we first uh, take them in the antitrial clinic. And what we do, we do certain baseline investigation. And uh, we do the uh, CBC, we do uh, renal function tests, electrolytes, leo function tests, fasting blood glucose, lipids, uh, lipid profile, urine examination, ultrasound, and uh, ECG. And we do, after that, we do the CD4 count in all the patients. And on basis of that, we start the anti therapy. Current guideline, guidelines, of, uh, as per NACO guideline, we have to start anti therapy in uh, WHO team to stage in 1 and 2 when patient is having 34 pounds less than 350. And in patient who are having apoxic infection or who, who are having HIV and TB infection or uh, pregnancy, there where we start uh, anti therapy irrespective of 34 pounds. Then we have viral load facility and the national program, and that is only for the patient who are having first line drug, first line antiviral failure, or who are where we are trying to start second line antiviral therapy. HIV drug resistant facility is available in the Department of Medicine, but this is only for uh, uh, this research services. Then we have certain uh, investigations which are related to tuberculosis, like we do the tuberculin testing test, we do Sputum smear for every patient who are having suspicion of tuberculosis, like patient who had profile fluctuation more than two weeks. And then, in cases where we required, we do gene expert to rule out uh, baseline uh, uh, drug resistance. And then we do the uh, uh, this uh, culture sensitivity also by using uh, uh, LJ media and uh, rapid culture like factor 460 and digits. So these facilities are available in the Department of Medicine and then we have facility of Lyme Proversy also. So these are the common anti trial drugs and uh, we have, uh, uh, we get the uh, anti trial drugs through national program free of cost and we provide drugs to patients free of cost throughout the lab. So we have NRTI, NNRTI and NPI. So we under program we have uh, judovidine, lamivudine, and then we have tenofovir, and we have NNRTs like norepine and efavirin, and we have recently NACO is providing second line drugs also, and uh, with protease inhibitors like lopinavir, combination of lopinavir and tenofovir, and then atagenavir and atenavir. This is like booster to DGM, so it protection uh, will not get uh, resistance, and then we have certain more drugs. These are not under national program, but we have in India, like integrase inhibitors and CCR5 antagonists like Maravirac and Revtigravir. So this is first line anti therapy regimen. As for national program, we have Jodavidine and, uh, and uh, Tenofovir plus Lamavidine. These are NRTI, and then we have two NNRTI, Efavirin and Nevirapine. So we give combination of either Jodavidine, Lamavidine, Efavirin or Nevirapine, or we give the combination of Tenofovir, Nevirapine, and uh, Efavirin. So this is available in the national program and we provide free of cost to the patient. Then we have second line drugs like uh, Jadavirin or Tenofovir plus Lamavirin and com uh, combination of Atenovir and Tetanovir. And we have also a combination of Jadavirin, uh, Tenofovir plus Lamavirin and uh, Lepanovir, uh, Retanovir combination. This is second line drug. And we start second line drugs when patient is having clinical failure or virological failure or immunological failure. So any patient who is on first line treatment, if they develop uh, like any abortion infection, new onset abortion infection, or 
we have a biological failure, then we need to start second line and we do MRI. And we do uh, uh, CD4 count, baseline then every six months. In follow-up CD4 count, if there is a decrease in the CD4 count, then baseline, then we also consider it as immunological failure. So these are uh, uh, guidelines, as per WHO guideline, we have clinical stage 1 and 2, and then we have clinical stage 3 and 4. When patient is coming, HIV positive patient is coming under category of clinical stage 1 and 2, we will start antiviral therapy when patient is having CD4 count less than 350. Recently there was meeting and now it was, uh, decided, it was decided that revised uh, CD4 count would be less than 500 from April 2015 to start antiviral therapy. In clinical stage 3 and 4, where patient is having a portion infection or they are having uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, we start antiviral therapy regardless of CD4 count. Then in patients who are having a, a HIV and TB co-infection, we start antiviral therapy regardless of CD4 count. Like first we start uh, antitubercular uh, anti treatment and after 2 to 8 weeks when patient is able to tolerate antitubercular anti treatment then we start antitubercular therapy. Similarly in patients who are having HIV and SPV or SCV co-infection, we start antitubercular therapy when CD4 count is less than 350 and when patient is having severe chronic liver disease then we start uh, CD4, uh, we start antitubercular therapy irrespective of CD4 count. So here is the uh, now recent guideline as per uh, 2014 ART guideline. Now NECO is providing single uh, pill fixed dose combination of tenofovir, lamivudin, and uh, efavirine. We give all the patients now uh, prefer to give tenofovir, lamivudin, and efavirine until there is any uh, contraindication. So coming to the uh, pregnant uh, and breastfeeding women who are HIV positive. So as per NACO guideline, we take the option B and now we provide the lifelong antitrial therapy, single pill, combination of tenofovir, lamivudine and efavirine. And for all HIV positive pregnant uh, and breastfeeding women, regardless of clinical stage or CD4 count or duration of pregnancy, we have to start antitrial therapy as soon as possible. And uh, as per NACO program, they rolled out across the country from January 2014, this program, this uh, regimen. So what about the ART regimen for the pregnant woman having prior uh, exposure of NNRTI or VCP? So if any uh, female who have earlier pregnancy or earlier exposure of antiretroal therapy, so due to single dose of neuropin, they can lead to neuropin blood resistance. And because of that, there could be cross resistance to the fibrinin also. So as per NACO program, we give the com in this type of patient, we give the combination of uh, tenofovir pl uh, plus lamivudine, and we give the uh, protein inhibitor like uh, lopinavir and ritonavir combination. And what about the uh, uh, neuropin prophylaxis for the HIV exposed infants? So, as per NACO guideline, we up to minimum of six weeks of age, regardless of exclusive breastfeed or uh, replacement feed, we need to give neuropin prophylaxis. And in the uh, per, uh, persons who we extend the uh, extend to 12 weeks, if the duration of antiretroviral therapy of the mother is less than 24 weeks, and she is breastfeeding. So, what, what about the uh, pregnant woman? who are presenting in the active labor, who earlier not started or not diagnosed as HIV positive, where we give the, where, where we initiate the combination of tenofovir, lamivudine and efavirine. And we continue with the same regimen postpartum, combination of tenofovir, lamivudine and efavirine. Coming to uh, side effect of the uh, antiretroviral therapy, so we have, uh, uh, like these are the common antiretroviral drugs we use in the national program and as per uh, uh, guidelines, like we have certain uh, short term toxicities, medium term and long term toxicities. Uh, so uh, for jitavitin we have common side effects like headache, nausea, vom vomiting, malaise and diarrhea and commonest side effect is bone marrow suppression and patient generally present with the anemia. So if patient is having 
hemoglobin less than 8 in these type of patients, we have to stop zetorvudine and we have to start tenofovir based regimen. Then estavudine we are not using nowadays and then tenofovir, uh, it is safe that only we have uh, nephrotoxicity. Then ephavudine, we have uh, sinus toxicities like uh, drowsiness, dizziness, confusion, vivid dreams, skin rashes and hepatotoxicity. And uh, nevirapine also is having hepatotoxicity and skin rashes. Protease inhibitors, uh, generally patient is having side effect like nausea, vomiting, hepatitis. And uh, sometimes uh, in long term uh, toxicity, they have lipodystrophy, dyslipidemia, and hepatitis. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone, uh, I shall be presenting uh, the management of an HIV exposed infant. As we all know that most of the children uh, acquire HIV uh, because of parent to child transmission and it can be transmitted at the three periods of time during the pregnancy, during delivery or by breastfeeding. So as, as previously being told in the presentation also, the risk of PTCT that is parent to child transmission can be reduced to under 2 percent by interventions including ARV, prophylaxis and during the pregnancy and labor and to the infant in the first six weeks of life. So I overview of my presentation will be I will be telling about the algorithm for the early infant diagnosis and the various uh, now the recent NECO 2000 guidelines on mode of feeding in HIV exposed infants. So coming to the early infant diagnosis, uh, uh, as the algorithm is appearing to be very complex, it is actually not very complex. Uh, as we all know that all the babies born to HIV infected mother, we start oral nevirapine within 12 hours of birth and, uh, and then this uh, nevirapine is being continued for 6 weeks and then at 6 weeks of age when the baby present for first immunization, uh, we send HIV DNA PCR with a dry blood spot and then further evaluate the baby. If the HIV DNA PCR at, first, at 6 weeks of life is positive. Then we repeat it with a whole blood sample and if it is positive then the baby is uh, babies, uh, now uh, uh, affected to be uh, told to be HIV positive and the baby is uh, continued on uh, cotamexazole and the ART is started. If the baby is breastfeeding at that time, the parents are advised to continue breastfeeding uh, till 2 years of age because it will prevent the other uh, malnutrition and diarrhea related morbidity in these infants. So, coming to the second limb, uh, if the HIV DNA dry blood spot PCR is negative at 6 weeks, the cotramoxazole is continued, but nevirapine is stopped at, at 6 weeks of age. Uh, at the repeat DNA, uh, HIV PCR is again done at 6 months of age, or earlier if the child shows symptoms. Uh, like uh, HIV uh, positive uh, symptoms, uh, like uh, immunodeficiency uh, related symptoms in the baby. If the HIV uh, 1 DNA is detected at that time, then again uh, the baby's uh, 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 whole blood PCR is again sent and if it is positive, the baby is labeled as HIV positive and manage accordingly. If the HIV DNA is not detected at that time, the cotramoxal is again continued and until the definite negative which is at 18 months of age. Uh, NECO has done, uh, told to do uh, at uh, 12 months of age, uh, again uh, repeat DNA uh, PCR or uh, antibody test can also be done at that time and uh, if the uh, breastfeeding is stopped at 12 months of age, the repeat test has to be done after 6 weeks. So this is the algorithm for NECO 2013. According to actually NECO has uh, taken up its guidelines from WHO recommendation in 2010. Uh, in 2010, WHO has given two options, either to do, give uh, exclusive breastfeeding to the baby's H HIV exposed infants or to give exclusive replacement feeding. But uh, uh, the, for the national guidelines, they have given some recommendation that if the, uh, if the national guidelines think that, uh, if the national agencies think that uh, they can support uh, exclusive replacement feeding, that is, that all depends upon the socio-economic status of that country 
and and the mode of death in uh, mortality in all these infants if the infants are dying with malnutrition and diarrhea it is better to give exclusive breastfeeding to these infants so uh, neco has adopted the guidelines from who that is option b to give exclusive breastfeeding for 6 months uh, along with daily navirapine uh, prophylaxis uh, from 6 uh, for 2 to 6 weeks of life exclusive replacement feeding is only given in special circumstances if the mother is being op- uh, opted for a uh, formula feeding or or if it follows if it, and if it is acceptable feasible affordable for the family and it is safe and sustainable so we have to be very cautious at the time of birth and we have to counsel the mothers according to their uh, according to their socio economic status and all mothers has to be counseled for exclusive breastfeeding as it has shown to decrease mortality in low income countries like ours low and middle income countries like ours and this has already been told so the dose of prophylaxis as sir has already told uh, for less than 2 kg babies 2 mg per kg once daily and uh, navirapine syrup is now available in a uh, strength of 10 mg per ml and the dose is 0.2 ml per kg for uh, 2 to 2.5 kg babies uh, we give 10 mg once daily and 1 ml of syrup navirapine and for uh, less more than 2.5 kg 15 mg is given so these are the summary of uh, various scenarios which are commonly seen in scenario 1 this is the most common one the uh, mother is diagnosed with hiv during pregnancy the uh, baby uh, the mothers uh, are started on lifelong maternal art as i have already been told and the babies are given on infant uh, prophylaxis with navirapine 6 weeks for 6 weeks but if the uh, mother is diagnosed with hiv during labor that is uh, that is a also a common scenario which we found that during the labor mother has come and uh, tested to be hiv positive at that time uh, in immediately maternal art has to be started and navirapine should be given to the baby and they have uh, given guidelines to extend this navirapine prophylaxis to 12 weeks at that point of time but if uh, another scenario if the mother opts for giving exclusive replacement feeding at that time then navirapine can be given for 6 weeks only in the fourth scenario it is written as uh, if the infant is identified as hiv exposed after birth uh, during the maternal hiv antibody testing or, or during infant testing and and the baby is breastfeeding at that time then navirapine has to be given at that time and it has to be given uh, for for uh, then uh, then for the duration is devised uh, according to uh, dna pcr test at 6 weeks of age and uh, immediately initiate 6 weeks or longer navirapine uh, uh, and extend if, if it extend to 12 weeks or more after that in the scenario 5 if the mother uh, is diagnosed after the birth of the child to be hiv positive and is not breastfeeding then they have advised not to give navirapine but dna pcr test according to the algorithm already shown and if the baby is uh, uh, if the mother maternal art art is interrupted at that time and baby is breastfeeding then navirapine has to be given to the baby so in the follow up of hiv exposed infant uh, we all call them to the high risk clinic and uh, at every time we we call at 6 uh, weeks 10 weeks and 14 weeks and club vaccination and uh, we monitor growth at that time uh, developmental assessment has, has, is also being done and uh, further cotrimoxal prophylaxis therapy has to be ensured at that time and immunization is very important in these case uh, and vitamin a supplements and every time they are being assessed for clinical symptoms of hiv that is that 18 months actually the definitive diagnosis of uh, uh, hiv is uh, done with three rapid antibody test and if it is negative then babies are labeled as hiv thank you all of you i am going to discuss concerns in uh, retrocognitive pregnant women uh, first of all effect of pregnancy on hiv uh, because of physiological changes of pregnancy hypervolemia of pregnancy there is a decline in absolute cd4 count and the cd4 percentage or cd4 ratio is a better marker hiv viral load also remains stable during pregnancy according to the studies which has been published there is no association between pregnancy and disease progression of hiv infection 
This was a systemic review of literature and meta-analysis which was published in FAB 15 and they included 15 studies. They found that in the absence of antiretroviral therapy, pregnancy is associated with small but appreciable increase in the risk of progression of AIDS, defining illness and HIV related mortality. But the evidence is too weak to form any uh, to draw any firm conclusion. When antiretroviral therapy is available, the effect of pregnancy on HIV disease progression is negligible. Uh, coming to effect of HIV on pregnancy, there are two outstanding consequences of maternal HIV infection on pregnancy. First is perinatal transmission, which is already reduced up to two percent because of use of antiretroviral therapy, and to, uh, the most uh, the risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes such as spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, preterm birth, perinatal and infant mortality, IGR, low birth weight. Uh, it may be because of H HIV infection per se, it may be because of use of antiretroviral therapy. This is uh, one of the earlier study which was done in tribal area of Manipur, India and they compared women with HIV positive status and HIV negative status. And they also compared asymptomatic HIV infection and symptomatic to HIV disease. And they found women with asymptomatic HIV infection was not associated with any adverse pregnancy outcome. Women with symptomatic stage 3 and 4 disease had adverse pregnancy outcome. They had significantly higher chances of spontaneous abortion, significantly higher chances of low birth weight baby, and significantly higher chances of preterm birth, which was almost 22%. This was a systemic review of literature and meta analysis, which came in 1998 and they included 31 studies. And they found higher risk of spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, IUGR, low birth weight babies, preterm delivery in women with HIV positive status. And they also found that uh, there was strong association between adverse pregnancy outcome and maternal infection in studies which were conducted in developing countries when compared with developed countries. This is a study from Tanzania which was done. Uh, from 1999 to 2006 and they found untreated HIV infected women had a higher risk of small for gestational age babies and preterm birth. Women with unknown HIV status had moderately increased risk. Treated HIV infected women had a risk similar to the general population. This is a study from Valor, India and they found the prevalence of HIV in their population was 0.5% and they found that uh, Significantly higher chances of stillbirth, higher chances of cesarean section, higher chances of anemia and pregnancy induced hypertension in women with HIV positive status. HIV infected women had higher incidence of antipartum hemorrhage, pregnancy induced hypertension, and purpural sepsis. Another is a retrospective cohort study from Colombia in to, from 2000, 2000 to 2007, and they found that women with HIV positive status had higher chances of uh, preterm delivery and higher chances of low birth weight babies. Other uh, variables were comparable in both the groups. This is a study from Nigeria and uh, it was a retrospective study. They found significantly higher chances of anemia, purpural sepsis, low birth weight babies and caesarean delivery in women with HIV positive status. And they also found that women who were not receiving antiretroviral therapy had more chances of preterm birth. <laughs> so they conclude that HIV positive status Increased adverse birth outcome and antiretroviral therapy appear to reduce the risk of preterm birth in HIV positive women. Coming to effect of antiretroviral therapy on pregnancy, HIV infected women should receive optimal antiretroviral therapy regardless of pregnancy status. The benefit of ART in reducing mother to child transmission is indisputable, but it can be lessened by adverse pregnancy outcome and toxicity in the fetus and neonate. This was a study from Spain from 1997 to 2003 and they found that the risk of gestational diabetes mellitus was almost 9% in women who were receiving antiretroviral therapy. Majority of the patients received protease inhibitor based to, uh, antiretroviral therapy and majority of the women receiving antiretroviral therapy prior to conception. Incidence of premature delivery was 29% and low birth weight babies was 28%. So they highlighted that HIV infected patients should be closely followed up during pregnancy. This is a study by Mercado et al. prospective study among 696 pregnancies from Brazil and they found women who were using antiretroviral therapy prior to conception had significantly higher chances of low birth weight babies and preterm delivery compared with uh, anti uh, women who were receiving ART during pregnancy only. 
this is a study from Johannesburg and they included HIV positive women with CD4 count less than 250 and they found women who did not receive uh, ART had more chances of low birth weight babies and preterm birth and they conclude that uh, immunosuppression per se is an important risk factor for both low birth weight and preterm birth and they highlighted the importance of earlier heart initiation in women to optimize maternal health and improve infant outcomes. This is another study from Tanzania and they found they also found uh, in women heart started prior to conception and uh, more chances of preterm delivery and uh, small for gestationalized babies. This was a systemic review of literature came in uh, 2015 and they included literature from 1993 to 2003 and they found that frequently <coughs> observed adverse birth outcome includes low birth weight babies, preterm birth and small for gestational age babies and uh, the most strong association with protease inhibitor based regime and women who were receiving ART prior to conception. Similar to this uh, systemic review which came in 2007, they found that antiretroviral therapy per se uh, did not increase the risk of premature delivery but when they did subgroup analysis they found that women who were receiving heart prior to conception and who were receiving protease inhibitor based to regime had more chances of premature delivery. This is a study from Africa and they found women who were receiving antiretroviral therapy had uh, mother to child transmission rate almost 2.3% but these are significantly higher chances of lower birth weight babies. Uh, this was a, st a study from Brazil and they compare asymptomatic HIV infected women and symptomatic uh, women with AIDS and they found significantly higher chances of preterm birth and low birth weight babies in women with AIDS. When compared with our study, we also found increased risk of preterm birth IUGR in HIV positive women than HIV negative women, although the difference was not statistically significant. Mean birth weight was significantly lower in women with HIV positive status and we also found increased risk of preterm birth who did not receive any treatment during pregnancy. Most of the literature suggests that HIV related confounders such as advanced disease, anemia, malnutrition may increase the risk of adverse pregnancy outcome and uh, when we uh, control these confounders, HIV infection per se does not uh, increase the risk of adverse pregnancy outcome. Although the beneficial effect of antiretroviral therapy for, for preventing mother to child transmission is indisputable, studies in developed and developing countries have reported conflicting findings on the association between ERT exposure and adverse pregnancy outcome. The conflicting results from various studies can be uh, partly explained by effect of ARV therapy, maternal disease status and geographical location. Uh, so to conclude, pregnancy in HIV positive women is at risk of adverse, uh, adverse pregnancy outcome like abortion, stillbirth, preterm labor, IUGR and anemia and medical providers need to understand this when taking care of pregnant HIV infected women and should be able to counsel women accordingly. Multidisciplinary team approach to management involving a HIV physician, experienced obstetrician and neonatologist is essential to optimize maternal and fetal outcome. Thank you. I would like to invite Dr. Aparna to discuss uh, zero discordant couple. A very good evening to all of you. Now, after the HIV in pregnancy, I would be discussing what is called, you can call a prequel to this. That is, when people are planning pregnancy, an HIV zero discordant couple, when they are thinking of planning pregnancy. So, let me define it. A zero discordant couple, there are two people who are in an ongoing sexual relationship in which both partners have tested for HIV and there has been full closure of HIV status. So, one is HIV positive and one is HIV negative and both of them are aware of the status. This obviously is a population at high risk of transmission to the HIV negative partner. However, all is not lost because this is a particular situation in which people are open. Uh, the option for antiretroviral treatment is open. It provides motivation for both of them for adoption of risk reduction strategies and it eliminates uncertainties related to the partner's HIV status. It is better to know the status rather than not knowing it. So the basic of management, the basics of management of this particular situation is the couple HIV counseling and testing 
rather than the individual uh, counseling and testing which is normally done so the counselors are they actually encourage that both the couples should be sitting together and this actually leads to an increase uptake and adherence to art for their own health increase uptake and adherence to the maternal to child transmission or parent to child transmission and then again it leads to more of an inclination towards hiv prevention to the other couples and also provides other advantages so the basic for management is couple counseling rather than individual counseling now for general principles for couples who want to conceive expert consultation is recommended so that the approaches can be tailored the partner should be screened and treated for genital tract infections before attempting to conceive because this highly increases the chances and the hiv infected partner should attain maximum viral suppression before attempting conception so these are some general principles of before they try to conceive now suppose what are the good hiv prevention strategies if the hiv for the hiv infected partner a combination art therapy should be started and a sustained suppression of plasma viral load below the limits of detection should be demonstrated before they attempt now this again is an ethical issue and both of the partner should be aware that this particular art is being given for the benefit of the other partner that the risk of transmission is decreased so they both of them should be aware and take the mutual decision and if it's an hiv non infected partner there is an option of periconception administration of anti retroviral pre exposure prophylaxis so that is an option if you we look at the combination art there are various trials and one of them has actually found a 96% reduction in the transmission to the uninfected partner but we have to remember that it is not completely eliminating the risk in the couples who have decided to conceive through unprotected intercourse so it does work but it's not 100% and the combination art before conception actually reduces the risk of perinatal transmission as well so this is like an informed decision that both of them have to take and this is what who also says that hiv positive partners with more than 350 zero discordant couples should be offered art to reduce hiv transmission to the uninfected partners so this is one of the option now coming to the other option for the uninfected partner is pre exposure prophylaxis which is use of arv medications by an uninfected individual to maintain the blood and genital drug levels sufficient to prevent an acquisition of hiv now what we do is hiv non infected partners should start daily oral tenofovir and emtricitabine this is the only regimen which is actually fda approved for this particular reason it should be started one month before attempting conception and should continue till one is trying to conceive and in between a baseline lab testing for hiv should be done every 3 months and a kfts or a renal function test should be done every 6 months now uh, the this is the cdc guideline which says that for discordant uh, couples with the when the woman is infected the safest option is artificial insemination so the husband semen is actually inseminated and the option it includes self insemination with a partner sperm during the periovulatory period now if you are talking about discordant couples with the hiv infected man the safest option obviously is donor sperm with artificial insemination if however the donor sperm is not acceptable sperm preparation techniques coupled with iui or ivf is recommended now again there has been a there have been lots of studies on how good these sperm preparation techniques are and they say that they have Uh, the most recent systematic review actually says that they are very good and the results are quite okay but the previous studies have shown that because the virus actually doesn't stick to the sperm and they only are in the secretions so it is possible that they are quite effective but then again if everything has a rider and nothing is 100% now semen analysis is recommended to prevent unnecessarily exposure to infectious genital fluid when the likelihood of conception is low so when they are attempting conception and there is a risk of transmission so they should do a semen analysis before actually trying to conceive thank you Come to the OPD. They come to the same 
example i am telling you example any person is having needle stick injury what we do we start post exposure prophylaxis immediately and we do baseline uh, hiv testing and then up to we then i am telling you and then after eight weeks and up to six months we do last one up to six months if there is no hiv positivity at the end of six months we declare he is a hiv negative case similarly uh, neonatologist have told that if any uh, kid uh, is up to 18 months they do the so up to 18 months they do the uh, uh, testing if he is not a child positive they say kid is a child negative after 18 months so, so there is there is a clear cut guideline there is a clear, clear cut guideline okay. i wonder when he grows up and the parents tell him that you must be a child i'm just so, no, this is a huge issue. And regarding uh, uh, HRT costs at the moment, yeah. what are the costs of the treatment? So, like in, uh, we have antitrial clinic in Maximo PD, where all the child positive patients come to the clinic every month for taking the treatment. And this is free of cost provided by national That's program. Right. Yeah, our, yeah. our network is very successful. And this is for lifelong. Yeah. This is for lifelong. lifelong. And uh, what we do, we call patient every month and we do their counseling also every month. We do the adherence counseling. We do the other counseling. We do the counseling for a person's infection. So there, is, there are set guidelines. And we follow. And tuberculosis association is very high also. Yeah, yeah. There is a... So we always do, I think you check the tuberculosis. Yeah, we, yeah, I mentioned in one of the slides. You, whatever uh, test we do for tuberculosis. And then uh, we have very good linkages between DOTS clinic and HIV clinic. But thank so, you for very yeah. outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Very educated. We both clinics, we have, have a national grid for doing, you know, Dr. Vita, everybody. 